going to bring this meeting back to order. Okay, welcome to the Queen Anne's County Commissioner's meeting. This is a public meeting aired live on our local cable television station, QAC TV 7. These media broadcasts provide county citizens an opportunity to watch and review our scheduled public meetings. In addition to our live audience this evening, we are providing remote options for citizens to watch and participate in county commissioner meetings. Citizens may watch our meeting live on our website at qac.org slash live or on our television channel, BreezeLine Channel 7 and High Definition Channel 507. Citizens may also participate by joining the live Zoom meeting by going to qac.org slash public comment. Citizens may also email comments to public comment at qac.org. Comments received will be summarized during the press and public comment period on this evening's agenda. We acknowledge everyone's participation and by attending you acknowledge that the session is both recorded and aired. Press and public comment will be taken and is limited to three minutes per person. If you do care to speak, please sign the information or excuse me, the information sheet on the outside on the, on the lobby. Comments longer than three minutes can be submitted in writing for the commissioner's review. We will now stand and be led in the Pledge of Allegiance by Commission Vice President, excuse me, Commission President uh, Jim Moran. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, please remain standing. Uh, we're going to have a moment of silence. Uh, Queens County just lost uh, one of our greats, and before I through the moment of silence, I just want to tell you a little about uh, Charles Nesbitt. So he was born in 1931. Coach Nesbitt, as he was known, developed a love for athletics. After graduating from college in 1954, Coach Nesbitt went to the United States Army, serving honorably for three years. Coach Nesbitt began working for Queen Anne's County Public Schools in 1959. He led Queen Anne's County High School to the first ever Bayside Championship, and he started the indoor track program in 1979 and he continued to coach until 1995, well after he retired from teaching. Uh, coach Nesbitt uh, passed away yesterday, so we just want to have a moment of silence for him. Thank you. All right, commissioners, that brings us to uh, today's agenda. So our agenda for tonight's meeting, October 24th, along with the regular session minutes and the sanitary commission minutes from the October 10th meeting have all been circulated for review. Do we have any additions or corrections? A motion to approve the agenda and minutes as submitted. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. All right, thank you, commissioners. Uh, we just held a closed session uh, under the general provisions Article 3305B3 to discuss land acquisition and Article 3305B8 to discuss potential litigation. And I do believe there is one motion we want to cover. Um, I move to execute to authorize the county attorney to enter into the legal services agreement with Grant and Eisenhofer, PA, and further authorize staff to opt out of the proposed class action settlement with both 3M and E.J. DuPont de Moors. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on this topic? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. All right, thank you, commissioners. That brings us to the uh, first press and public comment period. So we appreciate all citizens for taking the time to express views to the county commissioners. Comments are limited to three minutes per person. Comments longer than three minutes may be submitted in writing. This commission respects your desire and right to convey your message freely. When you come forward, please speak clearly at the standing microphone, state your name, your address, and your topic of interest. And in keeping with the dignity of our office, we ask that all views be expressed in a respectful and civil manner. First on the list is Teresa Earhart. All right. Greetings, commissioners and staff tonight. I would like to voice my concerns once again regarding the proposed landfill. I may sound like an emotional speaker, but I have unveiled many facts and many errors that should stop this process now. And I've asked myself repeatedly that if the landfill was coming within 1,500 feet of one of your homes, 
probably rules, laws, and regulations have changed this, since the purchase of the property in 91. And why are they being your 2014 waste management plan, as we have well known, con contains the constraint regulations of no homes less than 1,500 feet and no potable wells less than 2,500 feet from the uh, border of a landfill. All of our lots in our subdivision of Shrewsbury Farm Lane is in that less than category. So I'm going to hold up three platted maps. These are all signed by necessary governmental entities showing the final approval of the 24 residential lots for our subdivision. The dates start February 11, 2005, February, um, I've lost my place, to uh, June 2006. And you will note here that on these, where we see my green circle, the proposed landfill is already mentioned on the lot right next to our subdivision but was ignored. Um, it seems like something questionable has taken place, and I don't know what it is. All the agencies approved this subdivision going in. I also want to know how much tax money has been spent. Almost a half a million dollars was approved at the MAS board meeting September 28th of this year. Almost a half a million to contract with a phase two report, okay? Yet your December 13, 2022 20, notes, um, your meeting notes say that the MDE, check your notes, received the phase two geology and hydrology report for the quote proposed landfill. So is this report being done twice? I don't know. I plead to stop wasting money on the illegal location and put those funds into a new location that will adhere to your regulations. So we are in the process of establishing a concerned citizens committee with property owners from both within our subdivision and outside. Uh, we would like to meet with a group of county commissioners in the very near future to try to solve the problem. Clearly, there's only one solution, and that is to find a new site that will not negatively impact the citizens of your county and adheres to the laws that you have made. Thank you very much. Thank and you. I will leave my notes, pictures, drawings, so that you can review, because it's always evidential. Thank you. Anna, Anna, I don't want to mess up your last name. What's your last name? Weller. Weller, thank you. Good evening, my name is Anna Queller. I live at 129 Gray's Pond Lane. My topic tonight is Midshore 3. The county in its 2022 comprehensive plan, pages 3-21, recommends regarding the Midshore landfill strategy. The county will continue to assess the feasibility of the siting of phase three. The 2022 comprehensive plan was an update to the county's 2010 comprehensive plan, which states on page 8-11, the following criteria should be used when conducting a feasibility study for locating the Midshore Regional Solid Waste Facility 3 within Queen Anne's County. Compliance with state and federal permitting requirements. Detailed procedures for locating a new facility and level one, two, and three screening as outlined in the Queen Anne's County Comprehensive Solid Waste Plan 2004 to 2014. Meet environmental objectives, technical objectives, and social and public policy objectives. Protection of water resources and sensitive areas. Groundwater aquifer protection. Groundwater and well setbacks. Floodway and floodplain protection and setbacks. And distance from surface waters, especially tier two waterways. Distance from existing residential development. Distance from existing community facilities, such as schools and similar uses. Distance from county and towning, town planning areas and minimal impact on towns with respect to travel access routes. Impact on transportation systems. Distance from parks and natural areas and size of facility to meet disposal and transfer needs of current population and future population. Regarding the level one, two, and three screening procedures, the county's 2015 to 2025 comprehensive solid waste plan is identical to that of the 2004 to 2014 plan. 
that the criteria in the comprehensive plan refer to. Page 70 of the 2015-2025 Solid Waste Plan states, first level screening identifies all inherent constraints which would not allow a solid waste management site at a particular location due to conditions that render the site unacceptable for future investigation. First level screening criteria shall include all of the constraints identified below in table 4-1. Shall include. Number five in table 4-1 states, new solid waste disposal facilities shall be horizontally located a minimum of 1,500 feet from the nearest home, 25 feet from a potable water supply that is used for human consumption. There are numerous residential homes, all which use well water, that are less than 25 feet from the Harper Road site property lines. Therefore, the Harper Road site is rendered unacceptable for further investigation according to the county's own site selection process for Midshore 3 Regional Solid Waste Facility. I am requesting that you, the county commissioners, re review this primary source material respectfully. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. David Earhart. David Earhart, I live in uh, the Shrewsbury Farm subdivision. Gentlemen, ma'am. Um, in following up with Anna, the Queen Anne's County Land Development and Use and Development Code, Title 18, adopted in January 2004. It states that there is currently, does not permit a solid waste disposal in any zoning in Queen Anne's. Title 18 does allow an exemption for public use services, but that exemption requires four steps. First one being County Staff Solid Waste Advisory Committee conduct a joint planning session and rank all sites that are available for further analysis. I would like to see that list. County Staff, Step 2, County Staff will conduct an open public meeting participation to allow community input into this. The County Commissioners and the Solid Waste Advisory Committee shall oversee and arrange this meeting. I would like to know if this meeting was held. The final site selection, step three, will be made by the county commissioners based on the overall evaluation outlined herein with the recommendations of the Planning Commission, Solid Waste Advisory, and Public Opinion. This waiver is spelled out very specifically in Queen Anne Land Use Development Code, Title 18, 18, 1, TAC 15, Public Services. If the planning director receives the written consent of the county administrator after the planning director, county administrator, planning commission have all examined reasonable alternatives and have made a written determination that no reasonable alternative exists, the public use waiver may be used. I would like to see this waiver. I have not been able to find it. I have submitted a, a public information request using your forms to get that waiver. I would like to see it. If it cannot be produced, I do not see how we can proceed with this. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Schaefer? Good evening, commissioners. Pull it down. <laughs> I think I've got there it. You go. I think, yes, you hear me? Okay. My name is Eileen Schaefer, and I live also in the Shrewsbury Farm community. My husband and I built our retirement home there in 2022. My home and my well is less than 2,500 feet from the proposed solid waste landfill in Queen Anne's County. According to the documents, this landfill has been in the works as a three county and then a four county cooperative venture since the 1990s and early 2000s. Shrewsbury Farm as a community was established by Cal Gray in 2005 and 6 and on, as you can see, well after the conversations and plans were moving forward for this landfill. Just so you were aware, the value of the homes in Shrewsbury Farm surpassed the average home in Queen Anne's County by about 40 or 50 percent. So I must ask myself, why in the world would the county approve the community after it had already set the plans in motion to put a 200 foot tall landfill right next to it. On top of that, it was a planned community set up to be one of the more expensive communities in the area. 
Why would this community be approved? I can only come up with two answers. Either the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing, which I can understand. That sort of thing kind of happens. Happens in lots of organizations. Happens in my house. Or the managers of this county, these county commissioners right here, just don't care. But since I'm sure you are all thinking and caring persons, I'm quite sure the reality is number one. Not quite thinking it through when the approval was given to the community that, that to this community that would be less than 2,500 feet from a 200 foot trash pile, thus trashing some of the nicest homes in Queen Anne's County, not to mention Claiborne Fields, not to mention Northbrook, not to mention many communities around it. So my final thought is, mistakes happen. Please reconsider and plan to move this trash heap location. Thank you. Well, Kyle. Thank you, commissioners. It's good to be with you. First thing I want to acknowledge is um, the height. That's what really, there's two things, height and smell is what's going to bug me the most about this. I live at Shrewsbury Farm Lane. My name's Bill Kyle. When you talk about a 250 foot mound of trash over 100 acres or approximately 100 acres tall, you'll be able to sit here from the rooftop of this building and be able to see that mound three miles away where that trash site is. So just if that's what you want to see from your city hall or when you're out here having your markets and people are selling their produce and they get that whiff of smells here in Centerville, you'll start hearing complaints and somebody's gonna to have to do something because that, that thing over a 10 year period, that dump will get higher and higher and higher. And just to put that in perspective, you drive across the Chesapeake Bay Bridge over to Annapolis and on my car dashboard, it tells me when I'm at sea level, when I hit Stevensville, when I get to the top and I'm driving across, now this is where you're driving, it's 212 feet. So if you want to go another 30 some odd feet above that, you'll be able to see that landfill from right here. And it'll be huge. So I hope, my father was 60 years old when I was born and he taught me as an old man, he said, do things right. And that's what we're asking you to do is to do things right by doing the right things. Thank you. Thank you. Joe Stevens. Good evening, commissioners. Um, Joseph Stevens, attorney in Centerville. Um, as you know, I um, represent um, Jamal at Kent Narrows LLC. And uh, I want to thank you all for the hearing you had back in um, July where you um, deferred any action on Amendment 2302, which changed um, some of the mixed use requirements um, in the Kent Narrows are proposed to. Uh, you, it, you had expressed some concern at that, at that meeting about the 5% commercial being too low an amount of commercial as part of a mixed use in the Kent Narrows. And as a result of that, uh, Douglas Development, Jamal, um, uh, went back, looked at their numbers, and, and looked to see what they can do. And I sent a letter to you on the 26th of uh, September suggesting and requesting that um, you look at and perhaps amend the ordinance, the pending ordinance, um, or the proposed ordinance, uh, to increase the amount of commercial up to 10%. Um, to put that all in context, uh, Jamal's Kent Narrows in 2019 received concept plan approval from the Planning Commission for uh, about 100,000 square feet of uh, commercial space with 396 apartments above it. All right. Uh, that, um, uh, they weren't able to do that, and Paul Milstein, who's here today, can talk about that. But essentially, um, uh, uh, that development didn't move forward. What's being proposed in this amendment 
would be much less than that. And it's being proposed as a density bonus. So the Planning Commission has discretion, and you all do when it gets back to you for, um, for uh, sewer allocation, to review those plans and to see if it's appropriate to approve such a plan. So we've put forth a 10% um, amount for commercial. And, uh, and Paul's going to talk about going as high as 12%. What that would mean numbers-wise is almost 50,000 or 46,000 square feet of commercial space on the site, and it would drop the residential amount allowed under this density bonus to around 300, because when you add more commercial, it eats up land that you, to, you'd calculate your uh, residential on. Um, Paul will talk about it. We, uh, Douglas believes that this is a proposal they can move forward with. Uh, to put in context, Mears Marina was approved, final site plan, sewer and water allocation for 211 units. They never built it because it was purchased by Safe Harbor, and they went in a completely different direction. That site plan's void. Um, also, this property received growth allocation back in 1989 because it was pre-mapped, because it was pre-developed during the critical area provision. So you're using growth allocation on this property, um, uh, and, um, uh, and it needs to be redeveloped. Everybody recognizes that. Douglas has been willing to work with the county on a proposal that they can make work that they can make financially feasible. Um, and they want to continue to move forward with all of you. And I'll just leave you with this one note. On the 14th of February, 2019, was when the Planning Commission approved that concept plan I referred to. If you want to look at that meeting, it's really interesting and instrumental. It really was very well received. A lot of tough questions, no opposition. Um, and so take a look at that. I think it might be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Paul Milstein. Good evening, commissioners, and thanks for the opportunity to see you again. So I just want to reiterate what Joe has laid out with all the facts and figures and numbers that um, we look forward to coming before you again in, in, as, as soon as possible to see if we can move this, continue to move this forward. You guys have been very flexible and very amenable over the years, as the Planning Commission has. It's been a bumpy ride with a lot of trials and tribulations, and I get that. But sometimes you just have to get to the sweet spot. Um, the original project we had proposed required structured parking and several other things, and it was just too big and undoable, and the world has changed dramatically. What we have before you now, and we are able now to go to 12%, and we've really just tweaked it you know, through the conversations we've had and within the community as well. Um, is, is a surface parked, stick built product with about 46,000 feet of commercial on both sides. So we'll be participating in the special tax district, no problem there. And we have in the last year um, successfully financed about eight residential projects in various areas, very similar to this. This is what's working today. This is doable, we're confident in it. We realize we still have a lot of work to do and there's allocations and more designs and engineering, but. We ask for the ability to keep moving forward because this is something we can get done. And if not this, I just don't, I don't know what we would be able to achieve. This is doable. It's been a long haul. We'd like to put it away finally and move this project forward. Thank you. Ben Cooney. Good afternoon, commissioners, staff. My name is Ben Cooney. I'm the founder of Plastic Free QAC, and my address is 735 Oyster Cove Drive in Graysonville. Well, I'm here today to provide updates and, and a reminder that you have agreed to introduce the Bring Your Own Bag Ordinance. We know that you are very busy people and all of us have a lot on your plate and just don't want it to get buried in your to-do list. So we have now witnessed the ordinance passing in Centerville, and it is the 16th geographic location in Maryland to pass the ban, and really with very little opposition. So Plastic Free um, QEC have been invited to work with very closely with the town of, of Centerville in preparation for the implementation in January of 24. Their goal is to be proactive by one, educating residents and businesses about the details of the ordinance, and two, to distribute reusable bags that promote the Bring Your Own Bag campaign. We are all in agreement that getting rid of these plastic bags and replace them with paper is not the answer. Rather, the focus will be on encouraging people to bring their own bags, including 
handy tips on how to remember them because we all forget. Additionally, uh, Plastic Free has fulfilled its obligation to purchase a portion of the city's bag specifically uh, allowed for a SNAP and WIC people. We made that promise and we have uh, followed up. We have been extremely impressed with how Centerville is preparing in advance for the upcoming rollout and remain confident that they have set a positive and effective example for the rest of Queen Anne's County. I don't need to tell you about how bad plastic bags are for the environment. We see them all over the road. We see them hanging in trees. And you already know that less than 5% of plastic bags that get recycled, that a single use plastic bag is used for the average of 12 minutes. And that it takes up to a thousand years to decompose. What you may not realize is that an estimate that a one cloth bag can replace 1,000 single use plastic bags over a lifetime, over its lifetime. It's also estimated that the Eastern, which implemented their bag ban back in April of this year, saved the use of 1 million plastic bags the first month. Uh, just seven major stores were surveyed. So we look forward to working with you on getting this ordinance passed in the rest of Queen Anne's County. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I have who signed up to speak. Would anybody else like to speak at this time? Right, you'll be the last one. Thank you. Hello, gentlemen. My name is Brad Dutton. I live at 136 Gray's Pond Lane in Centerville. I'm here to speak about the solid waste facility. Um, just been studying up a little bit um, about the Queen Anne's County um, org chart here, and I see voters at the top. I see you guys, and you oversee like some buckets of departments here under the land use and environment section. There's two departments the Department of Planning and Zoning, and the Department of Pu Public Works. And on October 17th, 2022, the directors of those two departments sent a letter to MDE with you guys CC'd on it, our attorneys CC'd on it, and it says the following. The future siting of the Midshore Regional Waste Facility Phase 3 in Queen Anne's County at the end of Harper Road is consistent with the 2022 Queen Anne's County Comprehensive Plan, as well as the 2015 to 25, 2025 Comprehensive Solid Waste Management Plan. Specifically identified in the Solid Waste Management Plan, the County Commissioners purchased the 124 acre farm at the end of Harper Road for, future, for the future site of phase three. Therefore, the siting of this project is consistent with the County's long range planning strategies to provide adequate community facilities been shared with you earlier, I will share it again. Within the, the, the 10 year solid waste plan from 2015 to 2025, there is a first level of screening. The first level of screening says that, um, identifies all inherent constraints which would not allow a solid waste management at a particular location due to the conditions that render the site unacceptable for further investigation. First level screening criteria, a new solid waste disposal facility shall be located horizontally a minimum of 1,500 feet from the nearest home, it does not, or institutional building, and 2,500 feet from a potable water supply or wellhead that is used for human or animal consumption. It does not. This letter went to MDE saying it does. So I know this is gonna take time. I know it's gonna take time to find a new facility. You told us to be patient, and we are. But at the same time, this letter needs to be rescinded, it needs to be addressed, and it needs to be corrected. Thank you. Thank you. We'll close press and public comment. You want his address? Mark. Hmm? You want his address? No, I didn't catch it. it was All right, commissioners, we can move into our presentations this evening. Uh, first up, we'll turn to uh, tab number six, item three. We have Heather Tonelli, our Director of Economic Tourism and Development. She has Proclamation 23-51 for the 120th anniversary for the Friel Lumber Company. Go, Heather. 
a few guests here. Just can you introduce your, your guests? Yeah, this is great. This is the Freedom Factory that's coming up. They just celebrated their 120th uh, year in business. They have both the cannery and um, Creel's Lumber. Uh, and so t this week is Economic Development Week, and I couldn't think of a better way to, to celebrate that by celebrating a family that have a long tradition of employing our residents and a commitment to our community. I've got to say, they don't look anywhere near 120. No. They look great. <laughs> great. <laughs> have a seat. Have a seat. Yeah, have a seat. Yeah. Cool. Oh, sit down. we got four chairs there. Yeah. Jay Friel. Than most of you. Hi, I'm Gina Friel. Jay's wife. I'm Sam Friel. I am Bob Friel. Pretty good. I was in there today and ordered two doors, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that's, that's a, so your grandfather, your great grandfather? Great grandfather. Wow. So Sam is the fifth generation to start wow. in the business. Very good. Well, I've got a proclamation. I'm going to read the proclamation. Proclamation 23 51. Whereas Real Lumber Company of Queenstown, Maryland, a family-owned company, is celebrating 120 years of business, the company which operates Freel Lumber and SEW Freel's Canning House is owned and operated by five generations of the Freel family. And whereas in 1903, Samuel Edward Whiting Freel became Freel, Freel Lumber as a lumber mill operating several sawmills in the area manufacturing primarily construction lumber, railroad ties, and veneer products such as fruit baskets. The company began canning tomatoes in 1912 at the Queenstown Cannery, and whereas Freel Lumber Company continued to grow its footprint in Queen Anne's County by adding additional warehouse facilities and a kitchen and bath showroom. SEW Freel is the largest private label manufacturer of sweet corn in the country and the only remaining cannery on the eastern shore of Maryland. I did not know that. That's, that is pretty, that's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas most recently, Friels is one of Queen Anne's County's larger employers, providing employment for an estimated 250 employees, most of which are county residents. That's another kudos. Whereas Queen Anne's County values and appreciates the significant contributions to our community made by the Friel family and its employees. Now, therefore, the Queen Anne's County Board of County Commissioners wishes to recognize Friel Lumber Company, SEW Friels, its employees, and the Friel family for their commitment and contribution to Queen Anne's County economy and to congratulate Friel Lumber Company on its 120th anniversary. Congratulations. So just to put you on the spot, what do you attribute the success of the business over the years or over the generations? I mean, just learning from those who came before us primarily. You know, they, they taught us pretty well how to be run a conservative business and keep moving forward with small steps instead of giant leaps. So you being the youngest. Um, uh, yeah, the older, I got two, two younger brothers. You got two younger brothers. Okay. So. Um, any ideas that you have moving forward that you might want to change the way you guys are going to do the operation? Or, or it's really on the spot, Phil. <laughs> yeah, <I'll say>. No. <laughs> Robots, right? Are, in other words, are you, are you looking at doing things differently? or? Well, I think um, the way that things have worked over the past 120 years <laughs> has kind of gotten us to where we are today. And I mean, obviously looking to keep growing and moving forward. But um, Right now, kind of me and my brothers are learning from the generations that have come before us, my grandfather, my uncle, and my father, um, in any way we can. That's probably the answer you wanted to That's hear. That's a good one. <laughs> I saw like pass the test. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Very good. Picture? I think that's outstanding. Picture. Picture. Picture, absolutely. We don't get, we don't get many yeah. pictures with 120-year-old companies. So. <laughs> Thank you. 
Congratulations. 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 Young man. Congratulations. Congratulations. Future success. Keep it fucking good. Well, I know. I'm fine. That's awesome. We got a little rival. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah, yeah great wow. stuff. All right, for, for some more good news and good stuff, we have Director Steve Chanley, the Director of uh, Parks and Recreation. He's going to give us our Parks and Recreation update for this quarter. So, Steve, come on up. And he has a presentation up on the screen. And it's also in your book under tab six, item four, Roman number four. Thank you. Um, so, Last time we met was back in February, so there's a lot, but I've condensed it down into a short period of time, so. All right. <laughs> um, I decided to do a little different. Um, instead of having a ton of bullet points, I've uh, put up a sampling of some pictures that, of projects that have taken place. So the two pictures on the left-hand side are the new artificial turf fields up at uh, Bats Neck and Churchill Park. Um, in the top right-hand corner, we're uh, beginning to work on the uh, War of 1812 uh, Memorial. We're still trying to get some information from the National Park Service to uh, redo all the interpretive signs there. Um, that's a project that is uh, slowly moving forward. Down in the bottom uh, left-hand side, uh, you see a picture of a biker. We're working on our pedestrian. A new trail? <laughs> it could be. <laughs> We're working on our uh, pedestrian and uh, bicycle master plan. And as a matter of fact, on Thursday night at the Vincent Building, there's an open house for that master plan. So the community is invited to come out um, to that program. Uh, it's from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. Uh, in the middle, you see this is um, Mowbray Park. Um, it's a pickleball tournament that we had. Uh, we had 189 registered participants in that program, ran over the weekend. Um, it was a great event. Um, the bottom right-hand picture is one of our newest opioid trails. Um, that's at Route 18 Park. Um, it's a uh, small section of about, about 80 feet or so. Um, the purple trail denotes, you know, QAC goes purple. We have uh, purple flowering trees and some purple flowers that are in there as well. We're also planning to complete one up at Churchill as well. Uh, one of our other projects in the, in the top right, that, that was the condition of the Bat's Neck um, outdoor skate rink. Um, down below that is um, the new pavement that is on it. The picture to the right is a rendering of what it will look like. It's not going to be green, but um, we have um, that project. We've got new fencing on there. We've got new pavement. Um, we've got striping on there. In fact, the striping is kind of like a, a grayish white, so it kind of gives that appearance of, um, of ice. So, so, Steve, real quick, the striping that's on there is for what? It'll be for hockey. Hockey, okay. But you can... Did you do box you lacrosse like on it? Or? I'm sorry? Did you do box lacrosse on it? Um, you can. You can. Um, as a matter of fact, in about uh, a week and a half, we have a company coming from Minnesota to put up the, uh, the boards around the facility. So in a week and a half, that project's going to be done. Um, and we have been in communication with those folks that have interest. This right here is a quick listing. Um, I'm not sure if you recall, but at the beginning of the fiscal year, um, I came to you with about seven or eight projects. Um, and those are the, the first couple ones there, basketball court renovations, pickleball, futsal court, basketball court, white, um, I'm sorry, dog park. All those projects are going to be done within the next two weeks. Um, and then below that, just came to you um, uh, in August. Um, all of those should be done in just about uh, two weeks as well. So, you know, we've really hit the ground running this past fiscal year. We've got a lot of, a lot of projects that have uh, taken place and are getting completed. Nice to, 
to be able to show that. As far as recreation, uh, they've done a variety of different events this year. Um, in the uh, top um, left-hand side is um, act that's actually the course of the 5K and 10K out at Conquest, and that we did that in conjunction with the Corsica River Fall Festival. Um, good event. Um, weather didn't always cooperate the entire day, but uh, the intent was there to get folks out to, you know, understand the importance of the um, uh, the river. Um, we also have the, the uh, picture of Mattapique. We've got um, uh, the clubhouse. We did some concerts out there. Uh, we've had the 4th of July um, down at, uh, actually at Jamal's property in the um, uh, Chesapeake uh, Visitor Center. And then down in the middle, we did some uh, movies in the park, and that um, uh, particular one was up in um, uh, Southersville. Uh, and again, we've got a summer camp picture there. Well, we're doing some pickleball classes, and we ran a, um, a baseball tournament for kids 11, 12, and 13 years old um, this past, um, this past uh, summer. This here is a list of just some of the programs that are coming up. Um, you can see we've got a little bit. We've got some, uh, a, a trip to New York. We've got some uh, uh, soccer, basketball. Um, so we've got a lot to offer that we're, we're looking to put out there, and all those programs are getting ready to start in the next um, uh, couple of weeks. Uh, park ranger programs. Park rangers have been doing a lot. You know, usually, uh, I would say two years ago, people just thought that the park rangers were there just to kind of write tickets and pick up trash. Well, we've incorporated them into doing some programs, and there's, uh, they've done a couple of uh, guided hikes. Um, for the public, um, we've utilized Conquest, we've utilized Terrapin, Mowbray. So again, we're trying to, to make them a well-rounded um, program. Uh, we've got them involved in uh, some classes, the Marble Woodland Steward programs. Um, so we're getting them out there um, to do a little bit more and be, uh, be visible. Hey, Steve, real quick, yes. uh, what's the, um, the Hunter's Moonwalk at Terrapin? Um, Hunter's Moonwalk is, is one of the many different full moons that are out. Um, each, from what I understand, I don't know it uh, uh, intently. You're not but hunting by the moonlight, are you? I'm not. <laughs> um, but each full moon has a specific type of name, so I think that is the appropriate name oh, of that particular one, okay. and then they're going to go ahead and right. be able to give some more information. Gotcha. I'll come up with a... <laughs> I'll invite you to the next. Public findings, um, as always, James is uh, doing extremely well, submitting um, uh, grant applications to Maryland DNR. Um, we've got uh, Kent Nanner's Landing Bulkhead. Uh, we've got Muddy Creek. We've got Price Creek Dredging. Um, we're still working with the, the marinas and collecting fees for those as they renew their, um, their um, uh, rental agreements with us. Thompson Creek, as uh, Commissioner Corcorino knows, we've been meeting with him, and he's been uh, a big help with us uh, meeting with them. Uh, let's see. Park Rangers, we also um, are having them attend a Master Nationalist program, which is about an eight-week, pro eight-month program. They go once a month, and again, they are able to, you know, better interpret the uh, the natural environment, and be able to, you know, translate that to to citizens. Bridge Airport, um, has, if anybody's been on, uh, on the bridge and going down, or going down Route 8, you can see that uh, that project is almost complete, the runway project. Um, they are anticipating on being done, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the first week in November. Um, so they're, they're doing well. Um, DPW has done a lot of work with them as far as some work on their uh, commercial hangars, uh, doing some renovations in there, some landscaping. Uh, we've uh, assisted uh, with some of the uh, help in the office as well as um, um, minor improvements. Um, let's see. That's, you know, there's a lot to go with. And here's a couple of pictures that really just kind of show um, the, the status of the, um, the runway picture. And these pictures were taken, I would say, probably, um, probably about three weeks ago. So a lot has, um, has even changed in that, um, in that time frame. So. Um, been running. And the last thing I have is a Blue Heron Golf Course. Um, they did a project where they redid their um, their greens. Um, you can see the before and after. Uh, I'm sorry, they did fairways. Um, and you can see the before and after of, 
of, of those two projects. And now they are also finishing up a project of completing a new golf cart path on the front nine. So now they will have um, complete golf cart path throughout um, the golf course. Um, and they've been busy as anything. In fact, that project for the, uh, for the, uh, for the uh, carts path was supposed to be done, I would say probably about a month and a half ago. The business was so good they didn't want to interrupt it. They delayed it up until um, uh, this week. But there's a lot more that's going on, so this yeah. is tough. The uh, runway is supposed to have a ribbon cutting Saturday morning at 8? Yeah, it's um, one of the central folks are, I, I can't remember the name of um, uh, the Port pilot. Yeah, Port they're pilot. inviting folks back so they can cut the ribbon to reopen their facility to the public as well. Oh, their facility, not the runway. Well, their facility but they utilize the runway, so they've kind of tossed that name into making a... Okay, a but no planes can land on the runway yet. Um, I haven't talked to, to Linda about that. I don't think they're, you know, Linda will have that specific information as when it is open and ready for, um, for planes to begin to take off and all that. I don't think there's a misunderstanding. I think some folks think that runway is going to be open on Friday and people can, planes can start landing on it this weekend coming up. I'll get clarification. Okay. The time that to okay. Realize that. Thank you. And again, that, I know that ribbon cutting, it, it's a little bit deceiving. It looks as though one that the county's doing it. I mean, welcoming back their, their clientele to okay. their business. Okay. We'll have to keep the commissioner's jet at Easton until <laughs> then, then we'll move it back to Kent Island. Mr. Director, can we talk about Queenstown to Centerville Trail, pieces of it? Not now, not now, but we can, we'll yes. talk about that it. Can, uh, that's also part of the um, uh, Kimley Horn study um, uh, that will be have the open house um, this Thursday. So it, it talks about all trails and all connections that are that are going on. We also have um, uh, we're getting ready the to break easements around. between the two, um, or most of them. We it? don't have specifics. We know that that's a you know a preferred path, and obviously this town golf has agreed to allow right. us to. Yeah, that's a big deal. We've talked with the uh, town of Queenstown, and they had told us that probably about a year ago that the golf course was open to uh, allowing um, a trail through. Can't make it. Can Crumpton Landing. I'm sorry. Crumpton Landing. Crumpton Landing. Uh, we just got the engineering plans in yesterday, and we're supposed to meet with them Friday morning, um, along with Deep Creek Landing as well. So they're moving forward with that. Anybody else? Thank you. Right. Very good. Very Thank much. you. All right. All right, thank you, Steve. Very well done. Uh, our next presenta presentation is from Heather Tonelli, Director of Economic and Tourism Development, and she's going to provide her economic and tourism update. And we have the presentation up on the screen, and it also is in your book, item five, under tab six. Well, the right arrow. Yep. Hard to. Uh come after Parks and Rec, so I'll try to do my best to be interesting because, uh, you know, we're a lot of numbers and stats. But this week is Economic Development Week. Um, Monday, we went and visited North County businesses um, and Mid-County. Friels was one of them, and it was really great. We had some of our Economic Development Commission members with us, and it's really fun to get out and about. And we, we learned a lot from those. Um, but we thought it'd be a great idea to come in and give you an update on how things are going in economic and tourism development in the county. Um, I won't go into reading our mission, but overall, uh, we want to be a valued and respected resource to our businesses and the community members and our visitors. Um, we continue to focus on the four pillars, uh, and the, that's something somewhat new uh, since our, I've been here as far as our focus, always economic development and always tourism, um, but, you know, adding Connie Dean to our um, staff. Uh, we now have a workforce component, and then we've also um, engaged in community development. Things that we've learned from our comp plan um, is the, the need to 
our North County area, which is a, where our larger municipalities are. So we've been doing some outreach there to see how we can help them in their economic development endeavors. Uh, some quick stats how we gauge how we're doing in the county. Uh, we have a 1.5% unemployment rate. So that means, you know, we uh, hardly have anybody that's looking for jobs. Of course they are. But then that means there's a lot of jobs to fill and um, there's nobody to take those jobs. So well, every, everybody that we visit, every single um, business that we talked to yesterday, just yesterday alone, so workforce was their top issue. Um, so having Connie on our team and, and marrying the um, high schools and the college and the parents and the students to the employers is a, is a step in the right direction for sure. Um, so I'm really thankful to, to have her as part of our team. Uh, right now our population's at 51,000. It's projected to grow a little over 2% over the five years. Our median income is very strong. It's at 99.6 thousand per household. Um, and you know, I'm very competitive. So I, I shared with you, I shared with you a while ago that we were ranked number one as far as uh, GDP, gross domestic product, but we were also the sixth fastest growing county in the state. So it was an article about the top six. We were the sixth. Um, it was Howard, Charles, Calvert, and I can't remember the last one, but um, so things seem to be certainly moving in the right direction. Uh, the next slides I have, I, I won't go into a lot of detail about them, but you can look at economic development and industries in, in several different ways to say what our top industries are. Some people look at uh, gross domestic product, just the value of all the goods and services they produce. Some people look at job creation. Some people look at you know their total revenues. Um, so I've provided a lot of different slides, but you'll see that wholesale trade is, is the top when you're looking at the value of goods and services produced. Manufacturing is right up there, construction, uh, accommodations and food services. If you look at industry earnings, wholesale trades is up there again. And these are all, um, you know, 2020, end of 2022 numbers. Manufacturing is up there at the top. Um, government's always in there because uh, that's a huge job creator here. Um, industry job growth. That this, this slide's a slightly different. It's what industries are growing and hiring the most. Manufacturing comes in second there, construction. Uh, so you see some commonalities there. Um, and the largest industries for, for jobs is government. And that's not only our government. So we have a lot of people here that work um, in Annapolis and uh, DC. So you would accumulate those. Um, as far as the types of jobs that we have here. Some other great stats that we love to share, um, our Enterprise Zone, which runs from the Bay Bridge up into uh, where the emergency room is or right before it, we uh, approved $6.8 million in new um, construction. Or we don't approve the construction, but the, the value of that construction with approvals of the Enterprise Zone and 10 new jobs in 2023, um, as you may be aware, and I'm sure you know, we have a new EDIF fund, which is now 1.2 million. We were a little under 200,000 uh, before this fiscal cycle, and we're really excited to, to get working on that. It's about 240,000 in workforce monies that are be a part of that um, fund. Uh, this year alone, uh, we've created 20 jobs through that fund uh, with a capital investment of $38 million. So it's a pretty good return. Uh, some of the deals that we're working on, I just, I love, again, love numbers. Um, the pipelines, the projects that are in our pipeline, we have $53 million in projects that we are actively working on as a department. Uh, we had $17.9 million in deals closed, and we're actively working to market the 13, there's more than 13, but actively marketing 13 commercial properties that are located throughout the county. and. Um, I have a list in here and I won't go into those, but they're varying sizes. Some of them are only an acre. Some of them are up to um, 50 acres or more. Um, but it's important for us to work together with planning and um, with the realtors and, and just trying to make sure that we market those properties for their best uses. Um, a lot of them you'll find are along the 5301 corridor from the Bay Bridge up into Queenstown. And then there's a few in our North County, like the Chesapeake Bay Business Park that has a lot of land. 
Um, I always find these stats interesting. These are property sales, commercial property only, that uh, for years 21, 22, and year to date 23. Um, and you can see with the values of those in year to date 23, it was $45 million in properties sold to date. You can see the top three. So there's a lot more that are smaller. Uh, the Walgreens property in Chester, uh, Chester sold. That doesn't mean the Walgreens itself, it means the property. Um, Harrison's Yacht Yard sold for 5.2, and the Friendly's Retail Store. This is all public information, sold for 4.3. In 2022, we had the Hilton Transfer Ownership and Kennersley Marina. Um, in 2021, the Bay Bridge Marina property purchase. And you can see uh, commercial, which is the dark blue, the um, lighter blue is mixed use, you know, commercial, residential, or, um, and then there's some slips there. The value of new construction, so this is different. This is looking at, uh, based on permits that were applied for, the value of commercial construction. Um, and you can see 2022 was at 25.7 million. It fluctuates every year depending on when projects get completed, so uh, we don't take too much stock in the changes. We just hope to see growth over time. And FY23, we're at 41.4, so we've got a few months left. So we know 2023 is going to be a great year as far as that goes. Uh, when we went on those visits this week, we knew about some of the projects that are upcoming, but we didn't know dollar amounts. Just in the nine companies that we visited, there's 70 million in projects, and most of those aren't even on my list here because we didn't know what the amounts were. So there, there's a lot of growth that's happening. We went to ICSC this year, which is... Um, not in Vegas, <laughs> thank goodness it's in, uh, well, I would like to go to Vegas, but <laughs> that's a little out of our range. This was in um, National Harbor in Prince George's County, um, and we developed this guide not only to take there, but to also um, help our, our current retail, our vacant space and potential pad sites, help to market them. Um, so we went to ICSC, met with a few retailers, few grocers, uh, just looking to spread the word about Queen Anne's County. We have great uh, well, I guess it depends on how you look at it. We have great uh, traffic and no accounts, which are great for retailers and, and restaurants, but um, you know, on the flip side, we won't talk about that. But um, we have and great median incomes and high education levels. I mean, we have all the bells and whistles. Uh, so we're, we're trying to do what we can to recruit and backfill into retail. Uh, the Rural Maryland Economic Development Fund, you know, that was the 2.9 that we were awarded from the governor to Upper Shore Regional Council and then to each of the three counties that they represent. Um, we have just about all of those MOUs signed and most of the projects are underway and have received some disbursements. The 4-H Park, as you I'm sure remember, was our largest uh, project and They've had several disbursements to date, so or one done, one on the way. The schools have their um, career coaches in place and the career centers within the schools in place. Um, so we're hoping as soon as they get their, their furniture, although they're operating without it, that uh, we'll be able to have some sort of open house ribbon cutting. It's going to be uh, great. But most of the projects are underway. Some of the um, events that we've had in the past and or on the uh, up and coming. Oktoberfest was a success despite the rain. It rained that day. It was on October 7th, but still a pretty good turnout. We had that in downtown Stevensville promoting art. And we have a, a dance troupe that comes out there and um, actually dances in the streets every half an hour and loads of local artists and the businesses are open and it's a really great vibe. Uh, tomorrow is part of Economic Development Week. We're focusing on agriculture and technology paired together, protecting Maryland's agriculture through uh, technologies as a, an opportunity. Um, that's going to be at Chesapeake College, free of charge, uh, from 8.30 to 1 o'clock. Um, and it's going to be a, a really great. We have a mix of technology companies and a mix of farmers that are going to be there and various agricultural um, entrepreneurs. So um, we're excited about that. It's the first of its kind, actually. Uh, we did the field to table, which was back in October, focused on our micro um, ag entrepreneurs and those that have received grants. Um, and we also try to focus on different months that feature uh, various businesses. And in August, it was National Black Business Month, and this is just one of the 
Uh, we focused on a different business every week, and this is just, you can see, um, advertising that we did. Uh, if you were coming across the Bay Bridge, um, you probably saw the digital billboard that's right before the bridge heading east. And uh, we, we had this in many places. We ran a crabs and crushes campaign, and we worked with all of our restaurants that either had crushes, crabs, or both. Um, and we made sure to market them through our social media and they helped spread the word on our, our campaign, and we had videos done and that sort of thing, and we had 1.6 million impressions. People looked at these videos and looked at these uh, yeah. thanks these to that. Thanks to this promotion. Yes, but it's great. The Grapefruit Crush is my go-to now. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is great, and it's great uh, to build those partnerships with those businesses, and you can uh, look and see the feeds, and people are talking about, oh my goodness, where is this? I want to go, and that's my favorite restaurant. I've gone there for 20 years. Or, um, so it was really, it's a really great campaign that we hope to build on next year and further partner with our um, restaurant part, our restaurant businesses in order to, um, you know, generate if they're going to come. We want them to enjoy our, our local culinary uh, crabs and crushes. We are working on our new visitor's guide this year. We're going to have an outdoor guide, a culinary guide, and a visitor's guide. They're going to be smaller in page number, so it's not going to be three huge guides, but we're looking to focus on the culinary experiences that we have in the county, as well as the outdoor experiences. Um, so we're, we're really happy to get that going. Um, we're hoping that those will be out uh, by the end of January, early February. And the next thing I have is some tourism numbers um, for FY23, which you know ends June 30th. Uh, hotel tax collected was $991,000. There was a 17% increase. Some of that had to do with the fact that we had more rooms. We have another 120 rooms from the Hyatt come on board. But overall, the, you know, most of our hotels realized an increase in that tax. Keeping, keeping in mind that a lot, sometimes that tax has to, the increase in tax has to do with higher room rates, average daily rate. Um, versus occupancy, but they saw an increase in both. So that's 144,000 over FY22. So I would project that, you know, the following year we should see over a million dollars, if not more. I had a goal of that for this year, um, but I was off a little bit. Um, when I looked at July, we had a 25% increase over the prior year, again, largely due to Hyatt, uh, July 2023. Um, and I put on here for every um, marketing dollar that we spend, there's a $31 return. Uh, just quick on the events coming up, Bay Ridge 1 is November 12th. Uh, we had a call with them yesterday and they said they are at the 20,000 mark, so that's great. Yeah, and there's still some time to sign up. They've had a lot of signups as of late. We participate and help with the uh, Queen Anne's County Watermen's Association basketry, which is a huge uh, that tree lighting will be December 2nd, um, and they're going to have several <laughs> several trees. If you need a basket, we have them at our visitor center in the Queenstown outlets. Um, and then this year, uh, MEDA, Maryland Economic Dis Development Association, um, picks a different rural region to, to host their rural economic development event, and this year will be the Upper Shore region. It's going to be held at Cecil College, but it's still a great opportunity for our region to be highlighted. Um, and with that comes a PNC grant of $15,000 that I'll share between the three, um, Cecil, Kent, and Queen Anne's, and we're looking to do a pitch competition with that, those funds. So i um, very excited about that. Oh, we're currently working on uh, continuing to work on the ferry feasibility study, which is, again, a study to determine the feasibility for a tourism-based passenger ferry um, that would run around the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, we are in the end of October now. They expect it to be preliminary, preliminary findings December 2023 with the full report out um, in January 2024. So... Um, there were several sites that each of the counties pitched. We pitched um, the Kent Narrows and Mattapique, um, but the findings are still too early to determine, you know, whether those are feasible or not, but um, we're hopeful. And then the last thing I wanted to share is that we are working with several of our towns 
as I mentioned, community development is important, especially when our municipalities have the infrastructure necessary for some of uh, some of our uh, industrial development that could take place or commercial development in general. You know, we meet with the town of Centerville on a regular basis. We met with the town of Queenstown last week and, and plan on bringing in um, some opportunities for sustainable communities and grants. And um, we continue to work with Southersville and um, hoping to start to work with Churchill as well. But overall, we're, we're hopping and, and enjoying economic development. Every day is economic development. <laughs> hopping would be an understatement. <laughs> that was a very comprehensive report. You, you folks have been busy. Yeah. Busy. Best is yet to come. Well, kudos to you and your staff. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Thank you Madam Director. Commissioners, we have one more presentation this evening, and that is from uh, Mr. Eric Johnson, the Executive Director, Center for the Military and Veteran Families uh, Operations Update. So, Eric, if you want to come on up and introduce your guests and um, take it away. Good evening, Commissioners. And, uh, we want to start by um, just introducing ourselves. I think you know most of us, but just in case um, I was already introduced, thank you, uh, Mr. Mon. Uh, Joe Candela, I'm the chairman. Maggie Thomas, I'm writing the grants and helping with program development. Excellent. Thank you all. Um, it's really hard to sit in this room and not feel overjoyed by being in this county when you get to listen to the Friel family and. Steve Chanley and Heather Tonelli talk about such wonderful things. Queen Anne's County really is the best place to be. And I'm grateful for that. And I know everybody sitting at this table is. And it's additionally great if you're a veteran, if you're a member of the military or one of their families. So um, this evening, we have just a couple slides. I know you guys have gone long, so uh, we don't have a lot to brief. Um, but we have raised a total of 150,000 plus to date. Um, that has helped us open the center you've heard about on Ken Island at Bay Bridge Marina. It's positioned us to have all of the successes that we're going to kind of run through our numbers year to date. Uh, we've had a total of three suicide saves, one as far away as South Carolina. The other two were residents of Ken Island. Um, we've had now eight combat PTSD support groups. That includes the one that's happening while we're sitting in this room right now uh, at the Stevensville Center. Uh, and that's where we've had um, two of the saves. Um, we are starting our spouse and caregiver support group, which is something that's critically needed. That takes place this Thursday evening at 6.30 p.m. and it is Zoom enabled, so we're, we're gonna really start moving toward allowing our group attendees to participate virtually, uh, especially as a group that, and when I go down to other parts of the Eastern Shore to brief legions and VFWs, we really wanna be accessible to folks that may live as far away as the Lower Shore and even across the bridge. We've had three massage therapy sessions for veteran spouses. One of the veterans that was suicidal, um, his wife has been so stressed out and has had just no time to invest in herself. So one of the things we offer is three weeks of massage therapy, one hour each. And she had never even had a massage and was just overjoyed with tears. And we offer that in partnership with Massage by Jess here in the county where we can send a veteran and they bill us basically uh, for, for the amount. So all of our services remain free. Um, we've had three holistic therapies provided directly to 20 veterans, so that includes breathing exercises to uh, relax, deal with anxiety, depression, or symptoms like that. Um, we've done, Maggie, tapping, what's the official name for that? Tapping. <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll demonstrate it another time, but there's a method where you tap key places and um, I've done it now a couple times and it works. I thought it was the hokiest thing in the world and I think most veterans when they're presented this are gonna say, I'm not doing that. <laughs> but we've, we've had a ton of veterans do it and they're all saying, I'm doing this now, it actually helps. I'm sitting in the car and I'm tapping these key places and it really helps to recenter them. Uh, we've had 525 veterans, um, military family members, caregivers provided information, so that's healthcare information, claim support for the VA, legal, education, behavioral health, and then our um, support groups information. Um, our year-to-date impact continued. Um, six American legions um, have sent out our support group and other VAMSA information to a total of 400 plus members. 
Um, we've had eight thank you for your service veteran stories shared on QAC TV. So we work in partnership with Fred McNeil to um, have a good pipeline of veterans that can be ready to do that. Um, Jim Moran, I believe you are our first, and um, that was really good. <laughs> So when I was asked to do it, I thought, I don't know if I can follow Jim Moran or any of these other veterans, but I'll do my best. So I just did mine. I think that's coming out soon. Uh, we've had 19 um, book club sessions serving a total of 200 plus attendees, 40 weekly coffee meetups at Dunkin' Donuts, and I can't remember if I briefed, briefed this last time, but uh, the only Dunkin' Donuts that is not owned by the, um, the group that owns the Eastern Shore Dunkin' Donuts is Ken <laughs> Island, so that's the one exception. So. We're still going to work with them, but it's a lot easier that we have a regional manager for the rest of the Dunkin' Donuts to say, we've got this model that's been working almost a year now where every Monday at 11 a.m. veterans come. The groups are now 15 to 20 in size, very diverse showing, all ages, gender, you name it. Um, a lot of fighting over who's, you know, the best service, and uh, I'm never going to win that argument for the Air Force, but that's okay. We're going to keep fighting. Uh, but we're encouraging the regional manager to help us launch this throughout the Eastern Shore. So eventually, and our objective is in the next two to three years, we could actually market that if you're a veteran and you live on the Eastern Shore of Maryland, go to a Dunkin' Donuts at 11 a.m. on a Monday, and there will be a group there to welcome you and some fellowship. Um, those groups are so critical. I can't place enough importance on them because those really are a breeding ground to establish trust support, and before long, a veteran that's been going for a couple weeks will say, you know what, I, I've been having trouble with my claim. Does anybody know what I can do? And then we're able to kind of coax them into coming into the center, um, which is sort of a, a nice glide path. Uh, 33 referrals to partner agencies uh, here locally and state agencies as well. Uh, 15 VA claim support clients. Um, and then we now have 99 members of the Veteran Military Support Alliance. Um, so those are just a taste of our successes to date. And then we wanted to just briefly talk to you about what's on the horizon, and I'll ask uh, my partners in crime here to jump in whenever they would like. Uh, we're working to secure enough funding to open the center full time. We know how important that is to you all. It's equally important to us. Uh, we're anticipating some imminent grant awards and some large donor gifts about which we'll keep you posted. Uh, we had a meeting with the Fort Meade Alliance Foundation recently, Maggie and I, um, and we're going to go tour their Coon Center. If you've not heard about this, they have basically the equivalent of what we want to do at Fort Meade. And it is open to anybody in the state. Uh, you don't have to have, or no, you do have to have a military ID, I think, to get on. So that's one differential that, that's kind of critical. Uh, but we have a good partnership with them. There may be a funding opportunity. Um, Buck Duncan from Midshore Community Foundation connected us. But they have some models of how they're doing things to intervene with families that we want to borrow from. If we don't have to create something and start from scratch, we, we are all for it. Uh, we also met with Kim Craddaville from Senator Cardin's office about um, some congressionally directed funding, having the same conversation with Congressman Andy Harris. And based on our desire, and they believe, they've said this in our briefings, they believe we have stumbled across the model program that's worthy of replication. So if in time, we, our goal first and foremost is of course to open the locally facing side of the center as soon as possible. And if it's by the end of this calendar year is my objective, if not sooner, and then once we have that, then I think it's really starting to move forward with the training center where folks could fly in from all over the nation, take a week long course, get our business plan, and then through the congressionally directed funding, potentially apply for grants, some seed money, $100,000 or whatever that amount is, to start their own center and to, to be able to operationalize. Thank you for your service in their communities. Um, so those are some really great opportunities. Uh, we want to continue to invest in training opportunities with our future generation of military, our uh, sea cadets, our high school ROTC. We recently took a field trip to the Air Mobility Command Museum. We had over 20 uh, cadets attend. And what was so fascinating, they got to take a bus ride to uh, Dover Air Force Base where the museum is located and then have that travel time back where they were able to talk with other veterans, have a little bit of mentorship. And it was so wonderful to me to see the faces of these young guys and gals as they walked through the museum. And three of them pulled me aside and said, I am just so excited about possible military service. And I asked everybody I talked to in the cadets, so are you in the cadets because you want to be? That's your path. And they're very frank. The kids, that generation, as you know, don't hold back. And all three of these guys said, you know, either my parents wanted me to do this because it looks good on a college application, or they made me. And <laughs> 
That's not most of them. So if they're watching, I'm sure they're thinking, thanks for sharing this. But all three of them said, you know, I wasn't necessarily thinking about a military career. I'm enjoying what I'm doing. But I got to tell you, seeing the museum and interacting with veterans, and it's just, it's very helpful. And we're working with them on their mental health because uh, those that have prior trauma have a tendency to select into military careers, law enforcement careers. I'm sure that doesn't come as a surprise. Obviously, if you've been traumatized, you've been in scenarios where you may not have had control over a situation. So joining an organization that has uh, uniformity, rules, ethics, things like that. Um, so when we know that that number of people disproportionately select into those career fields, and we know that 90% of veterans who serve in a military zone overseas, a military war zone, they are subjected to trauma. Doesn't mean 90% come back with PTSD, but 90% come back having been exposed to the very things that cause PTSD. So working with these youth to help them understand trauma-informed care, help them to understand what resources exist in their community. Now, if they do go into service and they are subjected to additional trauma, PTSD, they are better positioned to survive in their veteran uh, time frame. Uh, we're promoting events um, for National Veterans and Military Families Month. We sincerely appreciate the proclamation that you guys did a few weeks back. Um, we're going to be promoting that. We are working with the legions, the VFWs, and other agencies to produce a calendar of events, not only for Veterans Day, but for the entire month of November. So you'll be seeing that soon. And we're going to try to synchronize all of those different organizations so that it's a lot easier for folks like yourself that want to come to something to not have to feel competitive over three or four events that might be at the same time. Uh, we are going to do an open house uh, for our center this year. Excuse me. Uh, there will be two Wednesday, November 8th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Everybody watching from home or in the room is welcome to join us. And Sunday, November 12th from 1 to 4 p.m. Uh, in the spring, we're going to be launching Project Healing Waters, where we're going to take veterans out on boats from Bay Bridge Marina, maybe at the Narrows. There'll be a lot of opportunities for that, and we've test driven that uh, with a recent trip that we just took uh, right by Libby's. And then um, we're going to be working with the University of Maryland Shore Regional Health to ID veterans. This is huge. Walt Petrie, one of our board members, uh, brought, uh, I believe it was three of the Shore Regional Health board members to take a tour of the center. Two of them happened to be veterans. And we had a tremendous conversation about the importance of you must know me to treat me. So if you're a veteran and the hospital system or healthcare organization that you get treatment from doesn't know that you're a veteran, your outcomes are more likely to be adverse under certain scenarios. And so um, in other states and other organizations, they ask the question at registration, have you served in the US military? If you answer yes, they never need to ask that question again. So it's a one-time thing. There's sort of an algorithm for if you answer no because you're 17, you may answer yes in the future. But once you ask for that data, you can do a ton of population health metrics and interventions that really help veterans. And then there are certain medications, certain procedures that are highly recommended against if you're a veteran and on top of that you have PTSD. So we already have a commitment from them. We want to get you in front of Ken Kozell and let's talk about how we do that. The other thing that's nice is it positions healthcare organizations to negotiate higher rates for reimbursement through VA, through TRICARE, DOD. So that's the, the, the um, uh, temptation, if you will, or the way to draw in the healthcare organizations because um, there's a little bit of money benefit involved, but it's also the right thing to do. Um, and so that's kind of where we're headed. Um, you guys want to say anything else? Um, my main focus is to raise enough money so that we're open full time. Uh, Eric mentioned we have uh, already mustered up 150,000. Our goal is by January we should be open five days a week and in full service. And we have Maggie Thomas to thank. We have filed for seven grants so far, and there are more to come, about two or three a month. And those grants, as they are awarded, don't happen immediately. It takes 30, 60, 90 days to get the money, and that's what our, I'm working on now so that we can fulfill being open five days a week. And I thank Maggie Thomas, who has the expertise to write these grants, read them, and it doesn't happen overnight. It takes hours and hours of time and experience, which if you look around in the industry, there are very few people who know how to do this and do it right. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Anything think, you want to add? No, I think you guys covered it. That was great. But we appreciate your continued support. And so what, what is it going to take to be open five days a week uh, throughout the year? What's, what's the operating expense? Uh, Jim, what we're hoping to do is to have 
the allotment money to be open for 12 months, not for six, because we don't want to go out of business in the midst of being open. So our goal is to have an excess of 450,000. Is that what you, you think you're operating? It's going to be every year 450,000? No, it's going to be considerably more. This year, it'll be 450,000. It'll be more like 1 million plus. Uh, if we get the, we have in place about a dozen volunteers who are veterans who are going to man the post um, or the office um, four or five hours a day, three or four days a week. And we're in the process. The next step is we have to investigate these people who are volunteering so that they have a clean record and no other background that would be uh, harmful to our association. We're in the midst of doing that. Um, and then we have to hire some full-time people who, in addition to the miracle of Eric and Maggie, we need to have some backup so that there are other professionals who have done this before and are paid. So that's why the budget will be a million plus. And so the center that um, I think I've shared with you all about the military Information Center or Maverick. We love our acronyms, so I had to have one for the one up in Allentown, PA, that I help work on. It's hospital based. There was a glide path of literally $50,000 the first year we did anything up to a budget of about $1.2 million. So that doesn't happen overnight, doesn't even happen necessarily in a year. Um, but the glide path that we have right now, we have a grant that we're hoping to get the information, the, the update on from Buck Duncan from Midshore Community Foundation for their annual cycle. Remind me, we asked for, it was two something, correct? And if you divide by two for the year? Yes, it was in the high twos. So uh, when I did the math looking at our glide path of bringing on certain staff part-time and then in January increasing their hours and then from there continuing, it's about 150,000. So the number Joe gave is the one that gives us the golden ticket of the board saying, oh good, you have 12 months of money in the bank. I don't have to worry about that. Um, we have commitments from several of the legions and other organizations where if we start looking at the fact that our fiscal year starts July 1, just like you all, uh, we have some commitments that fall right into that timeline where the 450, we've already raised a certain chunk of that. So when we come back again in a couple months, I think what we would like to do is show you the budget, show you kind of how our glide path looks financially. And, um, and I know when we come back, we're going to be able to report that we've, we've raised at least that amount. And um, we're now opening our doors full time with a combination of volunteers and, and paid staff. So very good. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. For the public, where is the open house at? It'll be at um, Baybridge Marina, and if you're paying attention at home, it's uh, 301 Pier 1 Road, uh, Suite 102. So it's on the same campus as Libby's Restaurant and has the best view of the bay that we could possibly have. Um, ROTC, how's that going in the high school? Um, that's an area that the we're... Counselors? So the counselors are supportive, but the, the path to sort of go from outside the school in is a process. And so we, um, we're getting ready to meet with Dr. Salins to specifically talk about this project so she could kind of help. That's, I didn't want to suggest that we're having a problem getting into the schools, but it obviously helps if you... Can we get that up on the... Oh, yes. I'm sorry. That would have been nice, wouldn't it? Oops. No, no. Yeah, just leave that. Yeah, thank you, um, Commissioner Duminil. Um, so we let us know if there's anything we can do. I appreciate that. I, I think we're going to be fine. Um, I work with Dr. Salins on the Queens County Council for Children and Youth, your council, and uh, have a good relationship. So we've kind of talked peripherally about this, and I think now that we're bringing on some additional folks, we'll have the additional personnel to go into the schools to, to do that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank each one of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, commissioners, that concludes our presentations for this evening. We can move into, uh, we have uh, a few action items this evening. First, uh, if you want to turn to tab number two, we have the uh, Department of Public Works. Mr. Quimby has uh, three action items for us this evening. Um, the first one, under administration. Oh, and um, Warden Cook uh, sends his apologies. He, he wanted to be here this evening, but he is out of town at a, at a detention conference. But uh, these first two items, are associated with the uh, the new regional jail project. So uh, again, uh, tab two, item one, on pages one through two, 
We have a uh, letter of intent. Uh, this is a uh, Midshore Regional Detention Center letter of intent uh, to the Public Safety and Correction Services Division, notifying uh, them of our intention to commence the planning study and to construct a new Midshore Regional Detention Center with our neighboring counties of Kent and Caroline counties on the former Eastern pre-release site in uh, Churchill on Flatiron Square Road. <clears throat> I move to execute the letter of support to investigate the feasibility of constructing a new Midshore Regional Detention Center with our neighboring counties of Caroline and Kent on the site of the former Eastern Pre-Release Unit located at 700 Flat Iron Square Road near Churchill. Second. Second. <coughs> we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? So moved. Does this mean we'll get the study back by March 2024? Or we have to have it in by then. Ah, uh, both. Excuse me. Both. We will have the study will be completed by then and has to be submitted by the state by then to stay in their funding cycle. Cool. All right, Commissioner Moran's on item number two here. This is the Midshore Regional Detention Center Part One and Part Two Programming Study proposal from our design consultants, and this will kick off the uh, design uh, programming phase of the regional detention center at the Eastern pre-release unit location in Church Hill. And the two counties uh, have agreed to split this uh, three ways with, uh, with Queen Anne's. We will be taking the lead, and I anticipate getting uh, you know, letters associated with their commitment uh, this week as well on this project. Move to approve the part one and part two programming study proposal from Collimore Architects in the amount of $98,900 for the Midshore Regional Detention Center and authorize the Director of Public Works to execute the proposal as well as to invoice Kent in Caroline County for one third of the fee upon completion of the study. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion here? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? There now. So it would be nice if we could, you know, I mean, I, I, I know that the state normally pays, what, no more than 50 percent? Well, less than 50 percent yeah. because they don't pay for air conditioning in the cell blocks. Right. So and they're paying 50 percent for a project to bring, build three jails at 50 percent per project is much greater than our regional. So it would be nice for them to kick in maybe 70 percent brought that up to you, your short delegation. Oh, I, we're going to bring it up to the delegation. <laughs> yeah, we will certainly talk with our delegation about that. And I can say that, you know, we've, uh, I want to hand it to Direct, Director Quimby and, and Warden Cook. We've, we've had very productive meetings with our counterparts in Carolina and Kent County and the state of Maryland. And they're all very, in particular the state, very excited about this initiative. It's the, one of the first initiatives. It is the first initiative like this in the state of Maryland. And we, uh, we are looking forward to a, a successful collaboration. So, on this Alan, project. do they... Um, handle it the same way they do with con school construction on public works projects like this? Uh, I honestly don't know how school construction is. So, like, in Kent? Uh, my understanding is it's 50% less the air conditioning component. Okay, so that we don't get any special treatment like they do on the school side. Because that was the idea behind regional regionalizing schools in some cases with certain places because you could take advantage of We'll take Better advantage funding. of, you know, it's definitely going to save the Queen Anne's County, this regional, it's definitely going to save us at least $10 million. Easily. Yeah. I, overall, I would say it's probably double or triple that, but if you contend all the three counties combined. Right. And that, yeah, I just wish they would rate it based on, because the, the theory behind that is Caroline doesn't have the kind of money to put into something, so would they put in something subpar because they could afford it? No, it's the state will kick in the rest to get it to what it would have to maintain standards, you know what I mean? So it's the same thing here. If they had to do a standalone, the state would have to kick in, and I think you got to make that argument that, hey, we're actually, as Queen Anne's being better off, we're kind of pulling them along with us, in a sense, from the financial side, so you guys are going to pay a lot less at the state, so give us a little bit more. I mean, well, I, mean I, I guess I look at it as if they're, theirs cost $30 million and the other one's $30 million and ours would have cost $40 million and you take 50% of all that, and now this new site only costs us $65 million. You know, if we get that 50 percent that they were going to honor all three. Right. But no, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. See, you get a better argument even because they would have given, say, Caroline 70 percent. Right. So now they're not giving them 70 percent. Mm -hmm. well, 
because they're only going to give way, us 15. We're going to ask the question. And, and oh, I, I know. I yeah. thoroughly agree, and I think we should beat on them. Wouldn't. We're saving them a lot more money than it's going to cost them. Are there, uh, Mr. Director, are there grants for it? Things like HVAC and security systems? Uh, this would be the, the grant would be from the state for the 48 percent or whatever you want to call it. That is the grant? That is the grant. That's just something they don't have in their grant process. And, and honestly, for a facility that size, you're probably talking a couple hundred thousand dollars, two, three, four hundred thousand maybe at the most. Just for HVAC? Yeah. Be more well, no, because you got heating, you're only adding air conditioning. You got to supply heating, but you're adding the air conditioning. So it's only to the cell box. What's the that? Admin can have AC. They pay for that. Right, the cell box, but that's typically just one of those ventilation, general ventilation systems that pumps cold air in there. So. Okay. Very good. All right, thank you, commissioners. That's all we had for engineering and we administration. Yeah, we can motion and a second, but we didn't vote. Did we vote? Yeah, we voted. Right. Oh, yeah, did we? we? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We did. You said yes. I did say yes. You said yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, it was. I don't, it was <laughs> I don't remember you calling for a vote. <laughs> it was unanimous, yes. It's been a long, uh, long meeting. Convene as a sanitary? Please. Bill. Oh, I make a motion that we convene as a sanitary district. Mm -hmm. I'll second that. All those in favor? San uh, there sanitary we go. board. Did you vote yes, Bill. Commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. All right, commissioners. <laughs> This is the Public Works Agreement Amendment 2 for the Chester Haven Beach subdivision. Uh, they are requesting an additional 36 months to initiate construction, and um, they've agreed to reduce the commitment for the allocation that they hold now from 180 lots down to 90 lots. Move to execute the PWA amendment with Chester Haven Beach Partnership, which will grant the development an additional 36 months to begin construction, as well as limit the ultimate development to no more than 90 lots. A motion is second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. There you go. 4-1. 4-1. Okay. All right, commissioners, that's all we have for the Department of Public Works. We have one other action item this evening for the county commissioners. If you want to flip to tab three, it is item one on pages one through five. And this is a, um, a resident has submitted a request to rename uh, the private road where they reside um, to Happy Camper Lane. <laughs> so, the, Thanks, yes, thank you, Mr. Quimby. Oh, you don't want to hear how this turns out, <clears throat> Happy Camper Lane? <laughs> <laughs> I'll watch it on television. <laughs> Probably going to have to pick another sign, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> don't think this one will be stolen. So this, this was a private road and previously named uh, Sportsman's Neck Circle, and uh, it's going through the process uh, through planning and zoning, DES, and public works. Staff has no objections to renaming the street. Where is the road? This sports bus? It's, uh, let me see here. There's a map. Yeah. Okay, I move to approve the road name change from Sportsman Next Circle to Happy Camper Lane. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Sportsman's Next Circle. Are you sure? No discussion. Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Very good. Okay, commissioners, that is all of the action items we have for the board this evening. Going right to round table. Round table. Who would like to go first? First or last? I'm going to defer uh, my time to Jim Moran. Oh, damn. I got nothing. I got nothing. Holy crap. Patrick? I'm talking about the Y? No, you can. No. It's in your district, it's, yeah. that's, sweet. that's you. Well, Active Aging Center. Well, I'll just say it was beyond. <laughs> the place uh, is amazing. It is. <laughs> it's, like it's, a amazing. Pal it's like a palace. And um, it was a wonderful uh, ceremony. And I'll, Chris and uh, Jim were there. I'll, and Jack, I'll let them talk about it. <laughs> Everybody was there. And Phil was there too. Yeah, yeah we were all everybody. There. Yeah. Jack's there every day. Yeah. I'm there every morning. Every morning. Waiting for the door to be unlocked. Yeah, I That's did right. not see you. I go there to cut the ribbon every yeah. morning. Picture. Oh, okay. Yeah. Very much. All right. Well, just me. Well, like you said. You know, I, I will say real quick though. <laughs> I appreciate the YMCA acknowledging past and present commissioners um, with um, naming the gym. Naming the gym. 
where the pickleball courts and the basketball courts are. Um, what they need. Huh? It's in honor of all past and present commissioners. Really? Yeah. Oh, but he's changing it. I talked and, to him. And future, right? Right, he's going to put in parentheses so when they need in, more money. in future. Too. <laughs> <laughs> so when you need more money, future, you already got it covered. <laughs> I'll sign him again. It works. You done? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, let's see. The Y was other in the cap of Queen Anne's County. I just think it, it, it it's awesome. It, it really is a uh, long time coming. I, I hope that uh, the citizens use it and, and our schools use it. And, you know, it, it, it checks off those boxes. Uh, last uh, meeting, I wasn't here. Uh, I was in uh, Minnesota with the Baltimore Metropolitan Council looking how Minnesota does things. Uh, it's the... You know, every year the BMC goes to a different city to meet with their leaders and see how they tackle their problems. Uh, and Minnesota is an interesting, uh, uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, I should say, uh, St. Paul, is a, uh, an interesting city. Uh, they have, I, I want to pronounce it right, Huns. You know, from, they came from uh, base Laos in, in Vietnam, a huge portion of the population. And then they've got the Somalis, which is a huge portion of the population. Then they got Hispanics and they got African Americans, and now they're 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 taking in some of the Muslims. So uh, it works for them, you know. Uh, they, they said one of the things that they do when their population starts to dip, they look at where the conflict is in the in the world, and they say, "Come on to Minnesota." I don't know how, you know, but it works. Uh, and you know, it was it was an interesting trip uh, to say the least. Um, so. You know, that's all I got on that. Uh, uh, I think that, uh, Todd, I, what I'd like to see is if uh, on our next commissioner's meeting or the one after, if we can get an update from uh, planning and zoning. I'd like to talk about where we sit on some of our projects, you know, the online service uh, and uh, time, turnaround time for permits and, you know, general, how's it going and what are we doing to make it better? Commissioner Moran, um, she's scheduled to come in in December, if that's okay. This meeting? Yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess that's fine. I didn't know that. So, so, thank you. Um, another one is, you know, uh, after I did the uh, town hall for the uh, seniors in Jacksonville, and uh, there was a lot of questions, a lot of questions about the uh, the housing authority and what what's going on with the housing authority. And you know, they'd ask questions, they couldn't get their questions answered. I know that many moons ago that uh, the Housing Authority was under the county's purview, and uh, I'd like to see what it would take to, to bring it back and what the process is. So if we could have some sort of presentation on that for all the commissioners, uh, just to see where, you know, if, if it is possible. I mean, I know we own the buildings, all but one, is that correct, mm -hmm. all but one? one. And, uh, I, I, you know, I know they need work, and, and I, I don't have a problem you know, doing the work and, and paying for the work, but I, I'd like to see a little peace and tranquility come about without the seniors, uh, you know, they, they can be a tough group, right? So, uh, you know. Do you want uh, to look at uh, if that's something else we could do on a regional level? Because we only have a few properties and maybe with some of the other jurisdictions, there might be some I'm up uh, for game ready. Of scale of doing yes. it that way rather than yeah. coming under us. I don't, I don't know which one's yeah. better, but. Well, I, for that, and as long as that, at, at Nesbitt, they're building a senior housing facility there. I mean, a, a four or five story building. Is that going to be run by the housing authority, Todd? Who, who's, who's running that? Do you have any idea who that is? Where? They are. They are. It's Slippery Hill. Yeah, they are. That's Green, private. Green Street. It's Green Street. Yeah, that's private. Green Street. It's private. Yeah. So it's totally private. So yeah. it has nothing to do with. Okay. All right, well. But that's a great idea, Chris, because we ought to find out, A, what Carolina and Ken are doing right now, right. how they manage theirs, and come up with something that's... Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, that's, that's great. If, if there's a savings in there also, it's but savings, i gotta, yeah. I got to believe that uh, I know we own a... Shared resources is always better. I mean, honestly... Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have a wait list, I, I believe, at all of our facilities. So, <laughs> and we won't be sharing any... No, 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 I'm that. talking about like, <clears throat> management resources. <clears throat> You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, oh, yeah, right, right. They probably have a director, can't have a director, we'd have to have a director. Correct. Three directors. You don't yeah. need three directors to do the population we're dealing with. There you go. So, something to look uh, yeah. into is uh, yep. is there anything else, anybody else would like to look into for future meetings? Okay, then. 
Make a motion to adjourn. So, uh, second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good night.